It's in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Father, I want to ask uh, in a special way for an outpouring of your grace upon this conference, which is taking place now in a most uh, unique and unusual way because of all that we're living through in our world. I want to thank you for the work of your spirit, which is moving in power in Vancouver. I want to pray that uh, the spirit would descend upon each of us individually and collectively as a body so that we might be empowered with confidence and boldness to proclaim the gospel, the extraordinary news of what it is that Jesus has done for us by his life and his death and his glorious resurrection. Lord, I ask for uh, your spirit to be uh, on me and in my mouth and in the ears of all our brothers and sisters who are listening and want to thank you in advance for all that you're going to do in uh, the beautiful Archdiocese of Vancouver. And we ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. So it might only be me on the camera, but I'm here on behalf of uh, the team to which I belong to, Acts 29. So uh, you can't see them. They're off screen. We, we kind of thought about doing what Major League Baseball is doing right now. You might have noticed uh, I watched one of the uh, first few games, and they've got all these cardboard cutouts in the stands, which just looks really kind of silly, but uh, it would have looked even worse in, in a presentation like this. So I'm talking, but I'm talking really on behalf of all of us. So let me just tell you a little bit about who we are. So Acts 29, uh, hopefully you all know there's only 28 chapters in the Acts of the Apostles. The whole point is that you and I are living right now better, we would actually say, that the Holy Spirit is writing right now the next chapter of the church in your life and in mine. And so we stole that image from uh, our Archbishop here in, in the Archdiocese of Detroit, Archbishop Vigneron. It's actually used uh, pretty frequently, I think, by many of our evangelical brothers and sisters. But that, that's who we are. So we all worked in parish ministry. I'm a priest of uh, almost 25 years now for the Archdiocese of Detroit. And we all served together uh, in a parish for the better part of maybe six years. Some of us a little bit longer, some of us a little bit shorter. And we describe ourselves in one of two ways. We're either uh, itinerant missionaries, uh, who the Lord has called to this mission, um, or maybe better yet, we might say that, uh, especially for, for priests who might be listening, um, much like God called us to forego marriage and family primarily, not exclusively, but primarily to care for marriages and families, so God called us by analogy out of parish ministry so as to really care for parishes, to try to speak into parishes, to try to work in a particular way with, uh, with my brother priests uh, and their lay leaders who are trying to help bring about transformation and recreation in their parishes. And so uh, we started in July of 2019. And in the first year of our existence, we've had the really the great privilege and blessing and honor of bringing a, a little bit more than 500, somewhere between 500 and 600 priests on retreat. We've done some work with uh, some lay folks around the country too, but uh, the bulk of our work has really been with, uh, with priests and everywhere we go, we see more or less the same thing, which is uh, a sense of being tired and often lonely and isolated and getting tired of playing whack-a-mole, which is what most of us do in parish ministry. I mean, your head just lives on a swivel the whole time. And it's really informed our work. And as we were praying just before we turned the camera on here, uh, somebody had the image, and I had the, the same image in my mind as it was uh, said over me, that what God wants to do right now is to shine something like a light, a very piercing light on all of us. And, and I want to further delineate that to say, I think he wants to bring clarity to three things, like a piercing clarity to three things. First, clarity to the times that you and I are living in, clarity to the mission that God's giving to us, and clarity to the urgency of these days that you and I are living in. So at the heart of our work in Acts 29, we have what we call three fundamental convictions. This is uh, the, something like the soil out of which our ministry really comes. And the first conviction is this, that you and I are not alive right now by chance. God could have created you to be alive at any moment in human history. 
I mean, it could have been fourth century Madagascar, right? Or 16th century France. But he chose, he willed, he destined for you and me to be alive right now at this time in history, in the midst of everything that's happening in our world and in the church. And we summarize this by uh, really finding a, a tremendous amount of inspiration from the words of St. Joan of Arc, kind of a, a condensation of, of some of her words, really, uh, where she says, I'm not afraid. God is with me. I was born for this. That's not just true of Joan. It's true of you. It's true of me. It's true of each one of us. I'm not afraid. God is with me. I was born for this. God has equipped you and me with natural and supernatural gifts for this moment. And no one else can play the role that you and I have been tasked with playing. I often think that God is he's creating this massive, beautiful, spectacular mosaic. And each one of us is a tile in this mosaic. I don't know if I'm a big tile or a little tile. I really don't care. I just know that I'm a unique tile, that I have a role to play. And you have a role to play. Now, why is this so significant? What, what's so special about this time that we're living in? There's a lot of ways to come at this, but one of the ways that we come at it that we find uh, to be particularly not so much inspiring as it is um, daunting is that this time in human history is particularly unique. So uh, just a little bit over a year ago now, 2019, was the first time in the United States that the life expectancy in our country declined for a third consecutive year. Just let that sink in for a moment. The life expectancy in the United States of America, with all of our wealth, with all of our technology, with all of our expertise, with all of our access to medical care, is going down. The last time that happened, was 1918. So what was happening in 1918? Well, two things. World War I, which is coming to a close, and the second thing, which we all know about now, is the Spanish flu. The Spanish flu, unlike what's going on right now, the Spanish flu killed 50 million people, give or take. That's what caused the life expectancy in the United States to go down for a th three consecutive years. What's happening now in our age? We're not living in a world war, and we may be living through a pandemic, but it's nothing like the Spanish flu was. Sociologists say that the life expectancy in our country is going down because of what they call deaths of despair. Three of them, most especially. The first is the suicide rate. The suicide rate in the United States since 1999 is up 30%. In rural America, it's up 40%. Amongst children ages 10 to 14, children 10 to 14, it's the second leading cause of death. That's the first rate of or death of despair. The second death of despair is the opioid crisis. The United States is 5% of the world's population. We consume 80% of the world's opioids. And the last death of despair, according to sociologists, is the increase in cirrhosis of the liver, which is up 65% since 1999, and especially in the ages 25 to 34, in, in what are supposed to be those ages that most of us look back and go, man, remember we were healthy and life was good and things were just going great and I was dreaming about all that was gonna come in that age group. Deaths due to cirrhosis of the liver are most rapidly increasing. So that's, that's our second fundamental conviction, is that the world in which you and I are living right now is crying. The third fundamental conviction that we operate out of is this, that Jesus institutes the church to be the means by which the cry of the world will get answered. That's what we're supposed to be about through the body of Christ, through you, through me, people are supposed to come to know the Father's love, come to experience, because of what Jesus has done for us on the cross, their own identity as the Father's beloved sons and daughters, be transformed, recreated by the power of the Holy Spirit. Here's the problem. Maybe you've noticed. 
The church is crying too. And there's lots of ways to talk about this. For me, anyway, the most powerful way to talk about this still is one word or one name. McCarrick. But it's not just Cardinal McCarrick or former Cardinal McCarrick. It's the sex abuse scandal at large, 2.0 now, at least in the United States. Um, 37% of Catholics in, in the United States of America, at least according to a Gallup poll, uh, are considering leaving the church because of the sex abuse scandal. But as a, a man who was a former pastor, I was a pastor for 15 years, those things are, are significant by all means. I don't want to diminish them. But quite honestly, they didn't impact our daily life anywhere near to the degree that just parish ministry impacted my daily life. So I was pastor of a parish with about 3,400 families or so, about 12,000 people. We had a staff of about 25, and we lived going from thing to thing to thing to thing to thing to thing, so much so that I took the, the month of July off after I left parish ministry before we began this work in Acts 29, and I was with um, one of the members of our team and her husband on our, uh, for some of that time, and I, I, I turned and looked at them in, in the middle of this and just said, you know, I think I'm in PTSD. And I meant it. Most pastors that I've come across over this past year, these 500 plus guys that we've had a chance to minister to, when we talk about this, they all just nod their heads. This is something like the untold story in the church. This is the root crisis, in my mind, of the real problem in the church. Most parishes are just broken. Parish ministry, I think, is broken. We need to do something different. God's calling us to do something different. That's a talk for another time. But that just speaks into this third fundamental conviction that the church right now, on a whole host of levels, is crying. So in, in saying all this, I just, I just want to shine some light into this area, this uniqueness of the time in which God has chosen, destined, appointed you and me to be alive right now. All right, that's the first bit of light that I think God wants just to, to shine. What, the second thing is this. You know, Jesus is not just kind. This might be particularly apropos for men. You know, a lot of us have an image of Jesus that goes something like this. Um, he's gentle. He's loving. He's compassionate. He's merciful. He's kind. And he's all those things, to be sure. Don't get me wrong. But he's more than that. <laughs> Jesus is absolutely and utterly unconquerable. He is Lord. That's the conclusion of a prayer for most of us. When St. Paul writes, Jesus is Lord, those are fighting words to the people to whom he's writing, right? Because they are living in the midst of an empire who has another Lord, right? That's what Caesar is called, Kyrios. Caesar is Lord. Paul says, no, actually, he's not. <laughs> Jesus is Lord. And for me, one of the most powerful passages that I found like the Lord has uh, encouraged me, us, in Acts 29, just to soak in is uh, Paul's second letter to the Colossians, it's, uh, or his letter to the Colossians, chapter 2, verse 15, where he says, God has stripped, disarmed, more literally um, disrobed the principalities and powers. What are these principalities and powers? the power of sin, the power of death, the power of hell, and Satan himself. He has disarmed the principalities and powers, making a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by his cross. Now, I don't know what comes into your mind when you hear those words, but I'll tell you what went into the, the minds of the people in uh, Colossae that Paul was writing to, because triumph for the Romans that's a very precise word. A triumph was something which was held in the Roman Empire under very particular conditions, and it usually had something to do with the emperor or a general. Early on, it was either one. Later, it was only the emperor coming into Rome after having won a momentous victory. 
And the triumph was this like mega parade in an empire known for parades. And at the head of the parade would be Caesar. He'd be riding in his chariot. And he'd be all cleaned up. And behind him, in a long line, would be all these captives that he had taken from the territory that he had just conquered. And at the end of the line would be either the general or the king of that territory, usually naked, chained, in a cage, with a sign above his head that said something like this. This is the guy who used to threaten us. He won't do that anymore. That is what Scripture says Jesus has done to Satan. He has triumphed over him by his cross. And the reason that's so significant is because you and I need to live with, act with, operate out of, conduct ourselves with, not optimism and not naivete. I don't want to encourage us to be optimistic. I'm not particularly optimistic about where things are going right now. But we are supposed to operate out of confidence, faith, and trust in the Lordship of Jesus. There is no other, despite how it looks right now, Jesus is Lord not just of heaven, but of earth. And the world and the church is firmly in his hands. And he's the one who's destined you and me to be alive right now. And he's the one who's calling us not just to be his disciples, but to do the work of ministry and mission, which is uniquely ours as his disciples in this day in which, this day in which we live. And so back in uh, January, maybe at the start of 2020, I was praying about uh, a whole set of different things. I was about to give a, uh, an address to some folks. Again, we would all pray together as a team. We do this all the time. We pray daily together. And as I'm about to go out to speak, I felt like the Lord said first to me and then to through me to everybody else. And so I want to share with you um, these two words. Stop complaining. Really. Stop complaining. Jesus is Lord. Live like it. Pray like it. Talk like it. Think like it. Let's, let's live this way as his disciples, huh? So, in the midst of all the uncertainty and all the craziness and all the confusion that's going on, all the unrest in the middle of the culture that we're living in right now, let's ask the Lord to give us confidence in Him, confidence in His Lordship, to remember to say that He is Lord on His throne. is not to say that He's far away. He's not far away. It's to acknowledge that everything is right here in the palms of His hands. All right? So, given that, what's our mission? What's the task that God's entrusted to you, to me, individually and as the church as a whole? Let me get to that by saying this. What's the message of Easter? This is how I've come to think about our mission more and more. A lot of us, me, I think, for a lot of years, a lot of years as a priest, would have thought the mission of Easter was something like this, or the message of Easter was something like this. Either uh, Jesus is risen, and so will I one day, right? Jesus is risen from the dead. I will rise from the dead too one day by his power. Or something like, um, on Easter Sunday, God was breaking in, showing what he could do, if he wanted to, but he really doesn't want to very often. I mean, miracles are kind of rare, and so he's just kind of sh almost showing off that day, but this isn't to be expected. That might be a, a gross caricature or over-exaggeration, but somehow we live that way. Many people in the pews in Catholic churches live that way. Either the message of Easter is, Jesus is risen, I will, or God once in a while breaks into history, but not very often, and so we shouldn't really expect it. What's the real message of Easter? I think the real message of Easter is this, deeply informed by C.S. Lewis, uh, N.T. Wright, and a whole host of others, but especially these two. Here's how Lewis puts it. 
Lewis says that, that the gospel is really something as simple as this. The gospel is the message of how the rightful king, that is to say Jesus, has landed in disguise and until he returns in glory to put all things right, you and I, we're supposed to be agents of sabotage. That is a great expression. Now, to be clear, let's make sure we understand what that means. The weapons, if you will, that we're supposed to use are the weapons of truth and goodness and beauty and reconciliation and love. But the Lord's asking you and me to, if you will, blow up, to rescue, to free, to liberate structures, systems, individuals, which are in the hands of the enemy, who he, Jesus, has bound, right? That's what Jesus says about the work that he's come to do. When a, when a strong man guards his palace, his possessions are safe. Who's the strong man? Satan. What's his palace? This world. Who are his possessions? Us. But, Jesus says, when someone stronger than him overcomes him, his possessions can go free. That's who Jesus is. Jesus is the one stronger than the enemy. He's bound the enemy so that you and I can go free. And as one of the members of our team, Mary, says over and over again, rescued people, that's you and me as disciples, rescued people, rescue people. That's what we're supposed to do. Rescued people, rescue people. So we're supposed to be agents of sabotage, or as N.T. Wright uh, is fond of saying, you and I are supposed to be earnest about the work of recreation. What happened on Easter was that God began the work of recreating this world, which he made, which he loves beyond all telling, so much so that his son became flesh so as to go to the cross, so as to deliver us and to rise from the dead, so as to conquer the powers of sin and death. That was the beginning of recreation. Paul says huh, to the people in Corinth that if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation or she is a new creation. Jesus says in Revelation, behold, I make all things new that began on Easter Sunday. And your work, my work, our work individually and as the body, which is the church, is to continue this work of recreation, mindful, of course, that we're never going to be able to do this fully until he comes back. You know, some of us know the song, Let Us Build the City of God. Terrible song. Don't sing that song. You can't build the city of God. But, as Wright says, we can build for the kingdom. Huh? What does that mean? Here's an example. I, I was talking uh, to a judge one time, and he said to me, how, how do I do this? How do I, how do I live my life as an agent of recreation in my vocation? And he came to me and he says, so maybe I could do something like this. So maybe because I have to sentence people for serious things, right? Could be murder. They could be going away to jail for life. And so I'm sitting there in a figure of authority. I'm, I'm a God figure to this person. And here's a way that I can recreate the judicial system in my own individual sphere of life, my sphere of influence. He says, maybe what I could do is I could say to the person, you know, um, you know Bruce, what you've done has repercussions and consequences. And so it's just for you, it's right for you to suffer those consequences right now. You've, you've taken a life and as a consequence of that, you are going to be in prison and you're gonna be in prison for the rest of your life. But know this, what you've done does not define who you are. You can still become a great man. And the judge looks at me and says, maybe if I said something as simple as that, is that my serving as an agent of recreation? I said, absolutely. He didn't even mention God there, right? He's trying to find a, uh, a clever way to, to bring in the gospel, even though in his particular situation he can't maybe explicitly name Jesus. That's what you and I are called to do. Whatever your sphere of influence is, to be an agent of recreation. So how does this play out for you and me individually? Let me give you two images. Let me talk first about uh, you and me individually. 
So Jesus says in the Gospel of Matthew, here, this is the prop from off screen. No, 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 just bring it to me so they can see your hand. That'd be great. See, this is very low tech here. So Jesus says in the Gospel of Matthew, he says this. He says, you are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. No one lights a lamp to put it under a basket. They put it on a lampstand where it shines for everyone in the house. In this little passage, huh, in Matthew 5, 14 to 16, I think Jesus is talking about the mission that is yours and mine uniquely or personally as disciples and corporately as the church, whether that's the parish or a diocese or the, the body of Christ as a whole. First, individually. He says, no one lights a lamp and puts it underneath a basket. Why not? Because well, that would be stupid, right? I mean, you, you don't do that. You, you turn the lights on so that people can see. I mean, I wouldn't flip the light switch and then cover the lights with duct tape. That would defeat the purpose. Same with lighting a lamp. You, you light a lamp in ancient times when there's no other light so that people can see, right? What, what's Jesus saying here? He's saying, I have not lit you on fire so that you would hide it. I have lit you on fire so that it would shine, or rather that I would shine, the Father would shine through you. And when he says lamp, this is what he's talking about. He's talking about a hand lamp. The Greek word is lichnos. It doesn't just roll off the tongue, but this is, this is a lichnos. Huh? And so I have one of these in my office, and I have one of these in my house, and I, I have it there because every morning I wake up and I want to remember, this is supposed to be me. So it's got a little slot here for a hand. Whose hand is supposed to be picking this up? Jesus. I'm the lamp. You're the lamp. And every morning, I want to be cognizant of the fact that Jesus wants to pick me up. And then he wants to bring me into different rooms in the house, if you will. The house is his world. And the rooms are those places where I go every day. And wherever I go, I want to shine. That's, that's our mission, huh? In our words and in our actions, to shine. But I'm going to give this off screen right now. The prop's going to leave. Thank you, Vanna. But it's not just, it's not just an individual mission. It's also a corporate mission, right? So the Lord says that you and I are as the church, huh? a city on a hill cannot be hidden. You are the light of the world, he says. Why, why do you build a city on a hill? Maybe you've been in um, the hillside towns of uh, Italy or France. You, you build a city on a hill because it's safe, right? You're up high. It's a place that I can defend. You can see people who are coming, right? So you build a city up high for protection. But you don't light up a city for protection. You light up a city on a hill so that the people who are down below in the valley, who are lost, who are stuck in the thorns and the brambles, they know where to go to find help, to find security, to find safety, to find love, to find provisions. That's what the church is supposed to be. Here's what N.T. Wright says about Paul's vision of what the church is supposed to be and what I increasingly think is supposed to be our vision of what the church is supposed to be. He describes it as a microcosmos, a little world of the world to come, of the new creation that Jesus began on Easter Sunday and is going to bring to completion when he returns in glory, but it was supposed to be ongoing each and every day right now through your life and mine and our lives together as disciples. He says this, Paul saw the church as a microcosmos, a little world, not simply as an alternative to the present one or an escapist's country cottage for those tired of city life, but as the prototype of what was to come. And this prototype, Wright goes on to say, Paul knew was going to be two things at the same time. It was going to be compellingly attractive and it was going to be threatening. 
So we said something about the, the, the uniqueness of the times that we're living in right now. Huh? I, I mentioned earlier that one of our convictions in Acts 29 is that um, you and I are not alive right now by chance. We were born for this moment. I'm not afraid. God is with me. I was born for this. You were born for this. This, this time, this age, this era is an urgent era or an era which urgently needs the work that God wants to do through you and me individually and as the body, which is the church. Why? Here's why. Because maybe you've noticed the culture at large all around us is restless. It's almost literally, and in some places is literally, on fire. People are clamoring for justice, for charity, for unity, for reconciliation, and rightly so at least at its best, right? Those are things which we as the human race should be concerned about. Here's the challenge. Politics, as essential as politics are, they can't solve the problem. Policies, as essential as they are, as, as important as it is to make sure that the laws that we have are truly just laws, they can't solve the problem. Why? Because the key to problem solving is to define the problem. What's the problem? This is the problem. The heart. My heart. Your heart. Their hearts. The hearts of all these people who are clamoring for justice, for peace, for reconciliation, for dignity. And only God can fix the human heart. And we, individually as disciples and as the church, we should know this more than anybody because the church knows from our experience what Paul talks about when he says that Jesus has knocked down the dividing wall of hostility. Huh? When Paul's saying that, he's talking about the, the wall in the temple which said a Gentile who passes this mark is responsible for his own death. And in Paul's day and age, they saw Jews and Gentiles, people who despised one another, come to a place where they didn't just learn to tolerate each other. They came to a place where they called each other brother and sister and they were willing to lay down their lives for each other. We know this in the church. We have the experience, or at least we should have in our experience, of God giving us new hearts and of us helping um, or experiencing, rather, people that we used to be estranged with now not just tolerating, but loving and calling brother and sister. Only the church can fix the problem that we're in right now, or rather only God can fix the problem, but he's going to fix the problem through the church. That's through you or through me. Or will we not let him? That's the challenge right now. The world's waiting. The people on the streets in all these cities are waiting for us to do something. To show a credible, compelling witness of the difference that God and God alone can make. Huh? That's why if, if we will be the church, if we will shine like a city on a hill, if we will take the time to share with people what Jesus has done in our own lives, if we will do what we can to be agents of recreation in all the spheres of influence that we have, then we will be a means by which others will be attracted to the church because they will see it as a credible witness. And others, to be sure, will be very threatened by it. Just like they were in Paul's day. Why? Because they serve other lords and they don't want to bend their knee to the name of Jesus. But we can't operate out of fear. So, will you, will me, will I, will us as a ministry, will you as a parish, will you as an individual, will you as a diocese, will we step into this age that God has chosen for us to live in, or will we not? Will we do it with confidence in the Lordship of Jesus, or will we not? Please, God, we will, brothers and sisters. We've been struck over and over again by uh, the opening prayer at Mass in the very first uh, week in ordinary time. I remember it hitting me that day. It's continued to resonate with me ever since. And in my 
somewhat uh, loose translation of it, it goes something like this. Lord, give me the wisdom to see what must be done and the courage to do it. May that be granted for you and for me. May God give us wisdom to see what he's asking us to do. And may he give us the courage to do it. God bless.